and I'm going to start the recording. Um, two things first off. Um, one, uh, feel free if, if you have to leave at any point, go into a meeting, or if you're working with patrons in the library right now, um, this will all be recorded. Um, so I will send out a link to the recording later today with a feedback survey and the slides that I have. Um, and then the second thing is because my internet connection is not great, if um, at any point my internet goes down, I'll make sure to have things running again smoothly um, and we'll pick back up where we left off. But I just want to bear have everyone bear that in mind. Um, so today we're going to cover NC Live resources for African American genealogy. I'm going to share the agenda. We have three resources that we'll cover. Heritage Quest, the North Carolina Historic Newspaper Collection that's powered by newspapers.com, and then Digital NC. Um, the last resource is not one that we subscribe to. It's actually one that is um, part of the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, which is housed at um, Wilson Library in UNC Chapel Hill. Um, but it is a resource that we include in our A to Z list of databases that I think is particularly useful for this subject. Um, and then we'll also have a little bit of time for Q&A and housekeeping at the end. Um, at any point, um, please make sure to type in the chat box if you have a question or want me to explain something. Again, I'm just repeating this um, in case folks are joining us a little bit later. Um, this is really your time and I want to make sure it's as participatory as possible. And with that being said, we have a quick poll to start us off. So I want to get an idea of what is your experience with helping African American patrons with genealogy. And let me know, no experience, rarely, occasionally, or often. This gives me an idea of folks' uh, familiarity with the content. And as we all know, um, people go to webinars with varying levels of experience. All right. So I'm going to end the poll and share out the results. We have one person with no experience, another who occasionally helps patrons each year, and then one person who has a lot of experience um, with this. And so, great, thank you so much for sharing. What we're gonna do um, is really start off thinking about the types of records that you wanna look at. I think one of the biggest misconceptions with African-American genealogy is the fear that people are invisible in written historical records. And to be honest, there are obviously more challenges, but I don't think it's necessarily impossible. Um, it really just needs to begin um, just as you would for other um, racial identities. Um, the first way to do that is really thinking about those types of records. Um, there are seven in particular or six in particular that I think are important. The first one being uh, vital records. So those are birth, marriage and death records. Um, which you can find in the um, Heritage Quest collection. The second one to think about is family supplied records. These can include um, a family Bible, anything that a family has documented, um, keepsakes, uh, funeral programs, obituaries, any sort of religious records as well. Um, and those won't necessarily be in something like Heritage Quest. And so um, I definitely recommend in working with patrons to get as much background information about them as possible and see how much time they've spent going through their own family records before they start to go into um, different government documents. And the third one is the census records. So these go from 1790 to 1940. However, the census records between 1790 and 1840 don't include the names of slaves or free African Americans. They only include the names of the head of household. Um, and then from the period of 1840 to 1870, um, 
not all um, African Americans are included in there. Um, it's really only a small percentage of free African Americans living in northern states. Um, and by far the biggest challenge of African American genealogy research is the 1870 brick wall. And what I mean by that is it's the first time that all African Americans were listed fully in the United States federal census by name. Um, prior to then, again, only the northern states and freed African Americans are listed. Um, and that's really only 10% of the population of um, African American people living in the country at the time. Um, the next set of records to think about are state specific records. Um, so some states have unique records. These can include indexes and registers. Um, and a lot of that would be in the State Library of North Carolina or in Wilson Library. Um, they have an extensive record of North Carolina history. Um, and you might be able to find information in their archives. Um, the pre-emancipation records, um, these include manumission, so documents that formal, uh, formally free individuals from slavery, wills and probate records, court records, property and tax records, registers for freed people, church records, military pensions, as well as the Freedmen's Bank. So that was a bank where um, freed African Americans could um, register for accounts, but that was only about 30,000 um, accounts were created through that bank. Um, and then the post-emancipation records, um, those are gathered to address the need for record keeping after slavery. Um, so those include the Dawes Commission and the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and they can also include some obvious sources of information like newspapers and military records. Um, for today, I'm using one person as an example of how to search within these collections. So this is a person that I um, randomly picked um, when looking through NCpedia um, as a historic figure. So John Ray is, he was an educator and an agriculturalist, and he founded North Carolina's first African American Farm Makers Club, which is now known as the 4-H Club. Um, he went to North Carolina A&T um, and graduated in 1909 with a degree in agriculture. And then he went, then went to work at the Industrial Institute in Alabama, now known as Tuskegee University, under the supervision of Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. Um, after a few years of working under their supervision, he returned to A&T. Um, and led their agriculture program and the farm on campus where he actually had students revamp the college farm and learn about crops and raising animals rather than having hired workers tend to the farm. Um, he was also a leader in local, state, and national organizations um, in the fields of agriculture and racial justice. During World War I, he organized um, against the discrimination faced by African-American draftees and wrote a letter to the Secretary of War at the time. Um, and Blueford Library at ANT has many of his personal collections, and a lot of it's now digitized and available online. Um, before we dive into the resources, I do want to kind of cover a couple of tips for searching um, in these records. The first one being write what you know. Um, I know there's an impulse to kind of start with one particular name, but it really helps to put together at least part of a family tree um, and write down the obvious. So names, dates of birth, locations, um, home addresses, if you have them. Um, and it really is important to think through the obvious before you start searching, because otherwise I think it can kind of lead to a little bit of frustration along the way. Um, and that's really what's going to be your roadmap when you're in HeritageQuest or Ancestry.com. The second thing that I think is particularly helpful for patrons to keep in mind is to cluster your research. And what I mean by that is start off with one branch of your tree and then focus on a particular section. Don't try and complete your entire family tree at once, um, but work with what you can find. So I started with John Ray and I worked back with his family, so his father, and then his wife's family, so his father-in-law in the 1900 census. And then I looked and I found actually that his father's side of the family, I couldn't really work back 
with that tree, but I could search in his father-in-law's side of the family where I was able to find his father-in-law's father and his father-in-law's mother in the Freedmen's Bureau records, which actually are not part of Heritage Quest, but they're part of the Smithsonian uh, Museum of African American Culture and History. Um, and I have a link to that on the next slide. And so this is just kind of giving you an example of um, how I was able to find more records when I searched through one section rather than just focusing on his direct family members. And the last thing that I want folks to keep in mind before we start searching is that different time periods require different approaches. Um, what I mean by that is the census um, changes every decade and the types of questions that it asks. Um, and they definitely reflect the political priorities of the time. So just as a reminder, 1850 was the first time that freed African-American citizens were listed individually for the first time. And then in 1890, most of it was destroyed in a fire and only fragments of it exist for Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, South Dakota, and Texas. And so that creates a roadblock, roadblock specifically for African-American patrons in North Carolina. Um, and it's definitely something to keep in mind as we're searching today. In the 1910 census, they started to include questions about whether citizens attended daytime school since 1909 because public education was being formalized at the time. And then in the 1940 census, there were lots of questions that related to the economy and employment, property value, highest grade in school, salary, um, because that was during the Great Depression. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau digital record. So again, this is the furthest back that I was able to find a you know, piece of John Ray's family tree. And I have a link to that um, search in the comment section of this slide. So again, this is not a resource that we subscribe to, but it's one that is um, part of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, right now, the search function is not working with my internet today. Um, but if I were to search Harris, and North Carolina. And let's see if it's going to work right now. It is just taking its time. But again, that's how you would use it. Um, it's not the same as Heritage Quest because you don't have the ability to um, zoom in on a digitized record. You just get the um, metadata that's available. And then another thing to keep in mind before we go into Heritage Quest, the 1850 and 1860 slave schedules and census. So those account for 3.9 million individuals who are not listed by name. Um, and they are 40% of the southern states at the time. I honestly think that searching through these, um, it's better to browse than to try and look up a particular name. Um, because it gives you an idea of the makeup of homes and farms um, or plantations in a particular location um, rather than looking for individuals because I think that that um, is an incredible challenge um, in this type of record. And I also think that there's this false assumption that all or most African Americans um, carry the surnames of slave owners. Um, while some people did, others chose, <clears throat> oh, just swallowed a fly. Uh, others chose their own surnames um, or selected a parent's given name as their surname. Um, so I really do want to debunk that myth and recommend that you take your time to examine the many different ways that surnames were created and passed on from one generation to the next. Um, this is something that I think people can get hung up on and it can derail research really quickly. All right, with that being said, we're going to go into Heritage Quest. Any questions before we get into it? All right. 
So again, this collection is powered by Ancestry.com. I know that a lot of libraries are providing temporary off-campus access to Ancestry.com as part of a deal that they've offered libraries um, in the last couple of months. But this is a collection that will always be available to patrons off campus. There's no terminals required like Ancestry typically um, has in public libraries. And so I think this is something that um, is really invaluable for patrons to know about so that when that um, temporary access is taken away from Ancestry.com, they can still use this platform and just log in with their library card. So we're going to go over to the census records. You can click search and go through and see all the different records that are available. You can scroll down and search in obituaries as well as books and local histories. But for now, we're just going to click on the 1930 US Census records. And I'll show you where I started in my search. So I put in John Ray. And I put in Greensboro. And then I was able to find if I click on view record and hover over, I have a lot of different information here. I can see birth year is 1910, which actually doesn't make sense for John Ray. So I'll show you exactly what who John Ray is. So this is actually his son, John Ray Jr. Um, who's being listed. But if I go to John D. Ray, I can see his father. And so I see that he's head of household. He's married. I see information about his home, whether they have a radio set, their home value. And you'll notice that sometimes there's inaccuracies in um, the census record. So he obviously did attend school. Um, so that is not correct. You can see that they have his occupation listed. And then I can go through and see all of his different family members. So I see his wife, Nanny or Annie also, it, um, as she's known in the records is listed as well as um, his children. And then I see his mother-in-law, Laura Harris is listed as well as his sister-in-law, Augusta Harris. Now, if I click on the individual record and click view, I can zoom in. And what's nice with Heritage Quest is it gives me the original version, but also the easy to read text of each table. And so I can hover over individual sections and see what information there is. What I also want people to keep in mind too is that neighbors matter. So it's important to actually jot down who are the neighbors who live around your um, ancestor that you're looking um, for in the census records. And so, you know, I made a note of Samuel Seaver. I also made a note of uh, Violet Snipes because this gives me an idea of, you know, what are the families in this neighborhood? Um, are they staying around um, for multiple generations? Are, do they own their home? Do they rent their home? What's their occupation? Um, and I see with Samuel Seaver that he is actually born in Africa. I learned um, a lot about this neighboring family. And I'm just going to put a pin in that so that you will follow up with this family later. But you can see the census record. And if I go back, oh, it's taking me to Ancestry's search function. And there we go. I can also see a map of exactly where his home was in Greensboro. And I see that it's right near Battleground Avenue and kind of near the middle of town. Um, 
and I can X out from there. So this is how I started off the search. And then I went back and put in, because I see him being listed as John D. Ray, I went back into the 1910 census and tried to put in John D. Ray and then Guilford. I can put in Guilford County or Greensboro, depending on how specific I want it to be. So I'm actually not able to find John Ray in this census. And the reason for that is he was studying um, at the Un Industrial Institute at the time. And so I actually had to do a new search for his wife's name. And so I put in Annie Ray, and then I put in Greensboro, and I searched. And I was able to find her as the first record living in the same house on Dudley Street. And I see that she is there with their newborn son at the time, living with her parents in this house. And again, I can go back and look at the neighbors, so viewing others on the page. All right, this is a little bit slow right now. Let's see if I can do it on the form. There we go, and I zoom in. And I also see that Samuel Seaver is still living there. Um, I don't see the Snipes family listed, and so I see there's one neighbor that is consistent in the last 20 years and I'm able to hover over and do the same thing that I did in the last form. Any questions so far about how I'm searching? All right. I can also see her maiden name listed so I could search back and find Annie Harris in the next census. But I actually decided to choose Richard and Laura when I move back in the census even further. Because I want to go back to who is the head of household um, and who is the oldest family member who would probably be listed first. So the next thing that I want to show you is how I went back and took a look at the 1900 census. And I looked for John Ray. And I looked in North Carolina because I wasn't sure if John Ray was living in Greensboro specifically in 1900. And what I actually found was that I wasn't able to see him listed under John D. Ray in this census. And so I had to go back and edit my search. And I put in Sidney Ray, his father. And I'm able to see Mount Terza, Person County, North Carolina. And I see that he is 45. He's a farmer. I'm going to view that record. And I see Johnny Ray is listed, or John Ray is listed as Johnny Ray. Um, and the family's last name is spelled R-A-Y instead of W-R-A-Y. And then I get that information from there and see that his father was a farmer. If I click on Sarah Ray, I can see if she had an occupation of some sort, and she does not. And I also see Eliza Day, her mother, is living in the house at the time. So then I can make a note of Eliza Day and search back and back in the census and see if I get anything past 1870. 
and then I can view that record and explore a little bit more. <laughs> As you can see, um, handwriting was very hit or miss in the census. Um, this is incredibly hard to read. Um, and so that hover feature is very helpful as I go through and just making notes of birth year um, is helpful as well. Because then you're able to pinpoint if the spelling is incorrect, but the birth year is right and they're living in this general location, maybe Person County or Guilford County, wherever, then you can kind of estimate from there um, whether this is exactly the person that you're looking for. All right, so now I'm going to show you the 1870 census. And I actually searched for Elizabeth Harris and I looked in North Carolina. So again, his father in law's family, his wife's family, and how far I was able to search backwards. So I chose North Carolina um, and I found that Elizabeth Harris lives in, lived in Granville County. And I see that, I don't see Richard Harris in here who is John Ray's father-in-law, but if I click on Ratch, this absolute misspelling and see that it was meant to be Richard Harris. He was 11 at the time. And I can list all of these family members. Sometimes with OCR, there's misspellings that happen within the platform and that's part of the reason. So if I go and view the record, I actually find, let's see. Scroll back. I can sometimes find if Harris is actually spelled correctly in here. I can always click on this arrow to go back in the record and see Harris. See, so with the OCR, they're confusing these cursive R's for S's. And so it's kind of a mix of sometimes things are actually misspelled and other times the OCR and Heritage Quest um, misspells for you. And so that's just kind of the quirks of using handwritten records. And so another thing that I do want to suggest when you're using Heritage Quest is going into the city directories because these are all, you know, printed. They are not handwritten. Um, and so if I were to search for um, Richard Harris, because I was working back on this side of the family and was looking in Greensboro. And I know that he's not alive from 1943. So I keep, can always edit my search. All right, I'm going to edit my search. And I'm going to add in, let's say 1900, and it'll kind of give me around that time period. Oh, let's see if it updates. Come on, there we go. So now I see Richard Harris um, living at a different address at that time. View record, so this is in 1905. And I see that he's listed as the pastor of Mount Sinai Baptist Church, 323 Percy. So that actually that address might be the address for the church and not for his home 
address, um, but I can make a note of that as some background information that I can explore further. And then I can go and look through 1912 and see that they're at 150 Dudley, which is different from their home address that's listed in 1910 and 1930. So that also might be the church address. So then I can use that later. What I also did is I took a look at the neighbors in this city directory to see what I could find. So I can do a new search in the city directory and I put in Samuel Seaver um, in Greensboro and look from there. And I see that he's listed and this is at 140 North Dudley in view record. All right, and then I'm gonna go back. You can always hover over certain ones and see what information is available in there. And search even further. So again, it's not really an either or in the types of records that you're finding in Heritage Quest. I think kind of painting a broad brush and looking at all that you can find, city directories, social security death index, the census records, allows you to kind of cast a wider net and explore um, and cross-check among different records. So that's how you would use Heritage Quest. We're gonna switch gears and look at the historic North Carolina newspaper collection next. Do we have any questions before we move on? All right, so now we're gonna use the North Carolina newspaper collection. This is powered by um, ancestry.com and newspapers.com. Um, Normally, I would be able to sign into my account and view some of the clippings that I've been able to make um, of different articles and have those saved. But right now, that sign in feature and the accounts are not working. Um, it's something that we are um, in a couple of email threads with with ProQuest in the last week trying to get that up and running again. So I typically would be able to show you how to sign in. Um, but today, I won't be able to do that but you can see other accounts that have done recent clippings in this collection. So typically you'll find that there are often people who are doing genealogy research, um, looking through obituaries. And you can kind of see all that's been done recently. And these are from two hours ago. You can explore some of those recent clippings and browse. It's pretty interesting what people are looking for and seeing some of this kind of user generated content. But again, we're going to just um, start off with the three different ways that you can search in the platform. So you can look at papers in this collection, see all, and this allows you to see an A to Z list of all the newspapers um, that are available in the North Carolina collection. You can search by title. So if I put in maybe Charlotte, I can see all the papers that are listed with Charlotte in the title or from Charlotte and explore in that way. I can also narrow by date range. So let's say I'm just looking at papers that are around from 1850 to 1894 and I can update and see the 21 papers that are listed here. So that's one way to use this particular list. I can always go back and take a look at C papers by location underneath the search bar. And what that does is it shows me a map that I can play around with that 
allows you to see a different visualization of all of the county newspapers that are available. I can see this for the entire state of North Carolina. And I can hover over and click on certain ones and see which ones are available. Let's say for Elizabeth Harris's family, I click over and look at Coal County. You can see all the county newspapers that are available there and search. Um, I can also take a look at Person County for John Bray's um, family members and see what I can find in there. So again, that's just one other way that you can take a look at this. Um, for genealogy, it's helpful to search by name. And so if I put in John Ray, I can just see what I'll find. So I have John A. Ray listed a couple of times. So then what I can do is always go back with my search and put in D. And again, the reason why I'm putting quotation marks around is so that I can capture the entire name. And if I see here, I have John D. Ray. And if I were able to log into my account, I'd be able to clip this section of this article and save it for later. I can also click on the I here and see if there's been any clippings of this section before. And I can search within for any instance of his name. I can also kind of change the brightness or contrast of this if I wanted to for just kind of readability. Um, so you have those options on the right hand side. Just reset. Now what I'm going to do is go back and you can see all the different times that he's listed. So he's in uh, Greensboro newspapers, he's in a newspaper from Lumberton, from Wilmington, Winston-Salem. And so you'll see that his work um, in the African American Farm Makers Club had far reaching impact. And I can clip all of these or print them or email them myself to have a record of them later. What I can also do again is look at um, neighbors. I can go back and look at his father-in-law and see if there's any um, matches. Richard Harris is obviously a common name, so I can put in maybe Richard H. Harris um, and see what comes up. Um, I can also narrow down by the particular newspaper because I'm seeing a lot of different Richard H. Harris's. So I can put in Greensboro, potentially, or even Guilford County, let's see. And I may not be able to find Richard Harris. Let's see, Richard Harris is listed in Oxford, which is in Granville County. I can see that I've actually been able to find sale of real estate for Richard Harris in Oak Hill. So I actually see him in a newspaper. And see that he sold 50 acres worth of land. And that's consistent with the Oak Hill record that I saw in the census. And so sometimes it can be a challenge, especially for African American genealogy, because these newspapers were obviously uh, white owned businesses. Um, and there's a lot of erasure involved in that, you know, in these newspapers at the time. Um, white people were really the ones who were listed as, you know, traveling out of town or going to the county fair and all this minutia about their lives. And you don't necessarily see that as much for um, African Americans who were living in these areas. But you might see it for things where there is a space like 
you know, real estate sales in the newspaper, but maybe not for as many social activities. Um, and so I can also take a look at Samuel Seaver, the neighbor, and see what I find in this newspaper collection. And so I was able to see, based on his middle initial, Samuel F. Seaver, and find some information about this neighbor who worked as a missionary for a time and built the first African-American congregational church in Greensboro. And I get some information about him. So again, not a perfect search experience, um, but you kind of have to mix and match different names and see what you find um, to paint kind of a broader picture of where um, patrons, ancestors were living at the time and explore from there. So I have some tips for searching in newspapers for genealogy purposes. Um, I definitely think birth announcements, um, letters to the editor, um, you'll see if, you know, in searching with John D. Ray, there were a lot of different letters to the editor that he wrote about the 4-H club, um, as well as some social activities as well and obituaries. Um, using that advanced search, you can specify the newspaper, the date range, use those quotation marks around full names, um, but you can also take a look at addresses, business names. Um, if we had more time, I would go in and search um, for the different churches that were listed for both um, Richard Harris and Samuel Seaver and explore. Um, I could take a look at sports teams or schools um, like North Carolina A&T for John Ray, as well as names of military units. Um, John Ray did not serve in the military, and so I wouldn't be necessarily searching for that. But I could also take a look at unique occupations as well, if you knew um, any ones that are kind of um, not normally listed um, or existing nowadays, like a gas fitter. You can also use abbreviations because they're trying to fit a lot into a small surface area. Um, they abbreviated a lot of different things in the newspaper at the time, street names, cities, businesses, even names. So WM for William or JOS for Joseph um, and then military titles as well. So that's something to keep in mind as you're searching. And the last resource that I do want to cover is Digital NC. Um, this is just to highlight some of the notable collections for African American genealogy. Um, some of your libraries may have contributed materials to them, um, but I think they're really interesting in terms of uh, being able to capture not only African American newspapers, but also yearbooks of African American high schools, um, as well as the women's clubs. So women's clubs came out in the beginning of the 20th century, if you're not familiar, um, Ida B. Wells, the you know, journalist was a huge proponent of them. And they were basically a space that a lot of particularly middle class African American women could congregate, um, discuss different social issues, um, and engage with each other politically. And so um, some of those business clubs, professional women's clubs, were really critical in the 20th century for um, African American women to be able to meet and share ideas. And so it is wonderful that they've been able to preserve a lot of these different collections within this one search. And so we'll take a look at that now. So in the NC Live list of databases, I'm gonna scroll up and see digital NC listed. So you can browse collections and exhibits and you'll see some of these highlights that I mentioned here and you can search within those individual collections. You can see the contributing institution. So for genealogy purposes, if you're looking for um, a particular newspaper, let's say in Greensboro, I have issues from 1941 to 1972. I don't have the full run of the newspaper. 
but I can search within that. Um, so that allows you to browse a little bit further and see who the contributors are. I can also search by counties if I wanted to. And let's say I'm looking in Granville County. And I can see all the different um, types of content that's available in there. So if I look at newspapers or yearbooks, and can search from there. So that's another way. What you can also do is browse all collections and exhibits. And so let's say I'm looking for North Carolina A&T and seeing what I find. I'm going to search in counties actually and pick Guilford County. And see the contributors here. And I could search for North Carolina A&T. And then I could actually search within Blueford Library. So if I put in John Ray and searched within this contributing institution, There we go. I just put in Ray and then I see a course program um, or bulletin from 1921. And I can search in there for any instance of Ray and explore further. And it's just honestly part of what makes this collection great is they have really high quality digitizations. You can download um, individual JPEGs of uh, like each page. Um, they're great for social media purposes. And so if you wanted to explore those collections um, and let patrons know about them in posts on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, um, I think that's a really engaging way for people to learn about, um, you know, these rare pieces of North Carolina history that are available to search from the comfort of your own home. Any questions about Digital NC before we go into Q&A? I know this is all just kind of scratching the surface of this collection. All right. So I did want to let you all know um, when I send out the slides later today, um, please keep a lookout for these resources that I've compiled. Um, so some of these are ones that I've used pretty extensively, um, like helping patrons find their roots, a genealogy handbook for librarians. I highly recommend um, the history of African Americans in North Carolina is incredibly interesting title. Um, and I've also taken a look at the uh, genealogist guide to discovering your African American ancestors, how to find and record your unique heritage. That's kind of a um, foundational title. And I also recommend taking a look at some of these research guides that are put together by UNC Chapel Hill and UNC Greensboro by subject specialists there. Um, so the Wilson Library Guide will allow you to see um, some of the collections that they have um, available, either um, in print or digitized. So you, you can see records um, in Wilson's manuscripts collections um, and explore from there. And they also have some recommended titles for genealogy and local histories. So I would definitely recommend taking a look at those um, when you get a chance. And before we head out, if we could take a quick poll and just let me know in the chat, which resource are you most excited to share with your colleagues, with your patrons, with your family members?
So again, find that chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and let me know which resources um, or one resource that you're most excited to share. Um, I've done this session a couple of times now and I really appreciate your feedback on which ones resonate the most. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is not a one of the pop up polls. This is just if you want to respond in the chat. Should have been clearer about that. See, so yeah, Adela is saying that she's looking forward to using the newspaper database. Um, so yeah, find that chat box and let us know in the chat which resource. Um, are you most excited about? So, uh, Monica is saying the databases from black organizations around the state look really interesting. Um, IFE is saying really like NC Digital. Yes, I highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, I don't know what the, you know, state of their digitization is like right now if they're continuing to um, seek out different collections to digitize, um, but it all it is already a very comprehensive resource. Um, and I think it'd be a great way to engage with patrons. Um, and use some of those Im images that they have, um, you know, for social media, for different collections that you're putting together. Could even be good for K through 12 um, classes, learning about North Carolina history. Um, these are just some standard resources that we provide for learning on your own. So we have self paced tutorials on a lot of our major resources. Um, it's basically the database on the right and some questions and tasks on the left and they're really no more than 10 minutes long. Um, but it's just a good way to get familiar with a resource quickly um, and do some searches. Uh, the shared promotional and instructional materials libguide is our kind of clearinghouse for um, resources that we've provided for marketing. So ones that we've created, ones that vendors have created, and ones that our member libraries have created. And so if you have some promotional materials or uh, training materials that you've put together that you really like, um, please um, don't hesitate to uh, let us know about them. We love to include resources from our libraries on um, this libguide and just different logos and videos and stuff that you can share out. So for Heritage Quest, um, there's a couple of marketing materials that we've linked to as well as some customizable bookmarks that you can always send out in, you know, grab and go bags and curbside pickup and um, all the different ways that our libraries are providing services to patrons right now. You can also take a look at some of the genealogy resources and advanced searching uh, lib guides that they have for ProQuest and Heritage Quest. And kind of explore from there. Um, Monica's asking, can we share this webinar with our genealogy workshop groups once we begin having them again? Absolutely. Um, when I send out the recording in the slides, I am allowing you to send it to anybody you'd like to. Um, and so feel free. Absolutely. Um, and then some vendor training guides as well that I've linked to. And here's just some of the ways that you can stay connected with us. Um, 
I definitely recommend following us on Twitter and Facebook for the latest updates on our new training offerings. We have formed an alliance with about seven other library um, consortia around the country. And so we have expanded our training and are offering at least 10 different webinars a month um, that are on different skills based topics for librarians. Um, things like how to teach online, um, skills like GitHub, so other sort of technical programming type skills for librarians. Um, we have one on teaching information literacy that's coming up that's being hosted by Minnesota's library consortia, Minitex, and so um, our social media is a great way to stay connected to us. Um, also signing up for a training newsletter um, is another way that you can get those updates each month in your email inbox. And if you have any questions about genealogy, using specific NC Live resources or training in general, um, feel free to email me directly, devin at nclive.org. Um, if you're having any issues accessing resources um, on campus or off campus, always know that you can email help at nclive.org. Um, and we're working you know, to resolve any technical issues that come up Monday through Friday during working hours. Um, and feel free to stick around for questions, but um, if not, uh, have a great rest of your Tuesday.